God is good. What a rich time it's been of study and preparation. I'm excited for what the Lord has for us today. Each one of us work with the Holy Spirit in your lives as we dig into God's good word. Let's look at our passage together in its entirety and then begin to dig in. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 7 through 14 says, Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The good word of our Lord. To get started today, I want to see Paul's command that fellowship with the wicked is forbidden. Look with me at the beginning of verse 7. It says, Therefore do not become partners with them. Well, with who? Who are we not to become partners with? For some context the kind of people that Paul is referring to, we just need to go backwards in our passage and be reminded. Look with me at verse 3-5. through five. But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Paul is describing people who are still in their sin. They are not surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior. What does it mean to not become partners with them? As he's saying here in verse 7. It means we, if we belong to Christ, we do not partner with, or you could say have intimate connection with, unbelievers. Those who stand against Christ as His enemies. Paul is clear in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Do you see the direct correlation of what is said in our passage here today? It is an important thing that all Christians know that the Lord's Word forbids an unbeliever to join their lives with a believer. This is especially true in marriage. To be clear, this doesn't mean that if you're already covenanted in marriage, you separate For God is sovereign over the fact that He might save one and not the other. Paul's emphasis is about the reality that our close relationships, our most important partnerships, will bring unneeded compromise if they are with unbelievers. We are on different paths in everything we do. And this needs to be taken seriously in our relationships does this mean you go home today and, and tell all of your secular friends we can't be friends anymore? No, that's not what I'm saying. Don't do that. That's weird. <laughs> Please don't do that. But it does mean serious and particular adjustments in your more intimate relationships needs to begin if we are going to take God's Word seriously in this matter. Here in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul says, Light and darkness cannot have fellowship. That's interesting because I think in general, we as a church look at that word fellowship too lightly, and so that seems odd to us. So let's stop and think about that for a moment. What is fellowship? The Greek word is koinonia. It is a unique and special bond. It's not a casual relationship or a casual friendship. It's an extra special connection. It's a partnership. Again, this is more than a casual friendship, a work relationship, or a neighbor relationship. 
It is another level of connection and relationship. Church, the simple fact is that we cannot have fellowship with those who are lost in the world like we have it with each other in Christ. We share a bond in Christ that we do not share with those who are in the world. They simply do not understand our convictions or our priorities. And if they say they understand, they do not agree with them to the degree that they participate in them with us. They're without faith. They're without obedience. Our closest friends, our truest family, our deepest relationships will be with true brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a part of the overhaul of your new birth in Christ. We've been removed from sin and death. Removed from the ways of the world. We've been enlightened. We've been reborn. To be given conviction. To be given power to honor God in a way that those who are still apart from Christ will not and cannot. This needs to be reflected then in our deepest relationships. True fellowship is to be devoted to the family of God and no longer with those in the world. Again, I'm not saying friendship. I'm not saying acquaintances. I'm not saying work relationships. I'm saying fellowship. That deeper bond and union and connection we share. Paul says here in verse 7, do not become partners with them. In this, I want you to begin to see the, the word fellowship differently than maybe you have in the past. I want you to see it as a deeper and more intimate thing than you've probably seen it to this point. You've talked about times of fellowship and maybe what you generally think of is just we're together. We're breaking bread together. We're in a space together. And it's, it's a more general just time together. But that word fellowship means something more than that. So I want us to begin to grasp the, the deeper value, the deeper essence of what is being talked about there. It needs to mean something more than casual time together. It needs to care Uh, It needs the care and affection and a depth that we mean when we talk about each other as blood-bought brothers and sisters, as blood-bought family. That means something to us, right? That's unique to the church. The word fellowship needs to fall into that same category for us. Fellowship is something we that is so special that we only have it with other Christians. The word fellowship needs to fall into this category for us, so that we will see our partnerships, our deepest relationships would be with those who belong to Christ. As you begin to refine relationships as you grow in Christ, I believe you'll begin to see real fruit of what God's word is pressing for here. Um, many of your testimonies in arriving and getting plugged in and growing here at Disciples have had many threads of of fruitful testimony of what this has meant for you, like you've never experienced it in the church before. Um, And if you're here and still maybe haven't tasted that, I would encourage you to lean in and, and open your door a little wider and initiate relationship to another degree so that you could begin to experience it in a way you have never experienced it before. Before we move on, listen to how John speaks to this very point in his first letter, 1 John chapter 1, 5-7. through seven. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin much of what Paul is about to say in this passage uh, that we'll focus on this morning points to the fact that the children of the light do not fellowship with the children of the darkness and so I want us to keep going so we could 
see this fleshed out a little more in our time together. Look with me at what Paul says here in verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Notice Paul doesn't just say that when you were when they were dead in their sin, they were in the darkness, in the darkness. And now that they have Christ, they are in the light. While that's true and wonderful, Paul says here they were darkness and now, and now are light. He is pointing out a profound and essential change that has happened in them. Understand clearly that Christianity is not just a change in our surroundings, our influences, or our preferences. That would make it essentially no different than any other man-made religion that does those things. No, Christianity is far more. At its core, it means a change in us. We become new and different people. This means that while your lifelong family and friends might not know a lot about you, I'm sorry, they might know a lot about you, your parents and your siblings and people you've run with for a long time, might know a lot about you, but they don't know the new you in Christ. Or at a minimum, They might just be getting to know the new you in Christ. We must see that the transformation that takes place at salvation is as significant as it gets. And while there is so much sanctification, maturity, and growing in holiness to still come, and therefore at the beginning of your salvation you might not look that different on the outside, in Christ you are utterly new and therefore empowered to live a very different life than you once did in your sin. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Church, think about the massive reality that statement is about you. This is not small. You have not just become a little excited about religion like most secular people in your life will perceive it. You've not just become a little zealous about doing right and making some changes. No, you were darkness, but you are now light in the Lord. Amen? What does this mean for us? It means that we are to walk as children of the light. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5.8 Paul once calls, once again calls his fellow Christians he's writing to, to action, to walk. And we've heard him already do this in this very letter couple key places, Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And then we see him use this phrase again in, in Ephesians 5, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Paul is going to speak this way one more time. We'll see next week in verse 15 of chapter 5. But it's important we continue to see the importance of this exhortation. The Holy Scriptures have charged the people of God to be attentive to how we walk. The Holy Scriptures have done this from the beginning. We go back to places like Deuteronomy 8.6 which says, So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. We see it in places like Psalm chapter 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man 
who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. We are to reveal the work of the Lord in our lives by walking and talking and living out what God has done in us and is doing through us. Let me ask you, just to make it personal, how are you walking lately? How are you living? What what are you doing with your days, these days that God has graciously entrusted to you? What is your testimony lately? All too often, we who claim Christ can be guilty of slipping back into a mode we're really are just kind of moving through our days. We're, we're punching our car. We're going through the motions. Here, another holiday is here. And we, we go through our traditions. But is there a walk and a talk and a witness as children of the light? It's happening in you. And can I just say, it's, that's dependent on you individually. It's Don't use the excuse, well, you know, my spouse is really lacking lately. Or, or my kids are just you know, against me in every way, or, or my boss is just, no. Who are you in Christ? And are you walking as a child of the light? That is your testimony. How is it at work, Christian? To help us apply this exhortation to walk as children of the light, let's slow for a second to really consider what does light mean in our lives? Light illuminates understanding and knowledge. Light reveals truth in a world of lies. The light of Christ at work in us means we will not just know God's Word, but believe it and put it to work. Light exposes sin and it helps us therefore to bring real accountability and to move to real repentance of sin, to turn from it, put it away. Listen to how Jesus speaks about walking in light, Matthew 5, 14-16. He says to the church, You are the light of the world. A, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He says that you and I, who are in Christ, are the light of the world. I I love Christmas time. And and a part of that is just all the lights. I mean, just even the stage, just gorgeous, just covered in light, and and there's just something about it. There's something life-giving. There's something sweet. There's something special. Church, that's what we are to be to those around us in this world. The light of Christ working in through us. We have to understand that the light that we bear doesn't originate in us. He says we are like a lamp that is to shine our light into the world. A lamp can only possess the light. Jesus Christ Himself is the light of the world and you only shine His light when you are lit by Him. Jesus says in John 8.12, I am the light of the world. A candle sits in the darkness as it doesn't produce light by itself. It must first be lit to illuminate. All those who live in their sin, who do not submit to Christ as Lord, but are the Lord of their own lives, they're dead in their sin. They walk in spiritual darkness. While they are physically alive, they have no spiritual light, the light of Christ Solomon said it this way, Proverbs 4.19, The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. 
John said it in John 3, 19, people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Everyone born in sin is desperate for the illumination of Christ to be saved and brought into the light. Jesus is the only one making all things new by changing the way we see everything, by illuminating our lives. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus, church. Colossians 1, 13-14, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Praise God that Jesus took our deepest darkness and forgave us all our sins. Only Jesus Christ can turn the light on in your heart. By God's grace, you, you might be feeling utter despair of stumbling in the darkness lately in your life. If this conviction is true, then stop trying to navigate the darkness on your own and by your own power. You'll never overcome it on your own. Instead, run to Him who is the light. Let Jesus illuminate you to lasting life by His mighty power. Some of you came here today not ever having experienced true light, the life of Jesus. Maybe you have seen the light from a distance, been surrounded by it. you even come to church and played out what you thought was the Christian life. But in the end, all you were doing was standing in the afterglow and not truly consumed by the light yourself. Today, if this is you, I pray God gives you eyes to see what Jesus has done on your behalf and that it would become all-consuming, all-praiseworthy good news to you. I pray that you are lit by the life that is Jesus Christ. By repenting of your sin and trusting your life, your entire life to Jesus. If you do this, share this with us so we can walk with you in the newness of your faith. No greater joy we'd have than that. For all of us who are saved by Jesus, we must see that we are now possessors of the light. God has called us to be a lampstand for the light of Christ so that those of His elect who are not yet saved would be saved in His perfect time. While many days you might long to be off of this battlefield that we're in, in this valley of the shadow of death, in these days we live. But be reminded today that in God's perfect plan, it is not time to take you home to be with Him and enjoy Him forever. The holy city is not yet filled with all those that God has ordained for to join us. Church, we must rejoice that heaven is coming but be patient because we know it is not yet time. I love the verse in Proverbs 4.18 as it points to the path we're on and the reality we look forward to. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Full day is coming, church. Holy heaven will be greater than we can know or imagine. Our path for righteous living, for showing others the light of Christ, it is the purpose of our days until He calls us home, until that full day. We cannot be casual about our God given call. We have to take this seriously, church. We are called to continue to labor and to struggle in this dark world with the light of Christ with the knowing that God will save and adopt His elect family as He prepares to bring us all home. As a Christian, when you look out into our lost culture and hear the stories about how sin is at work, do you despair of this life as, this, as if it's the only thing you're living for? No. Why? Because we live for the kingdom to come. Christmas time is a celebration of the lowborn king, the king of our salvation, the kingdom we've been saved into, and the fullness of the kingdom we look forward to is coming. 
we do not look at this lost society with despair and hopelessness. No, we see it for what it is, a lost world in the darkness, desperate for the light of Christ, the light we have now been entrusted with to testify and to share. We do not over-consider ourselves with those who are being saved and those who are not, because salvation belongs to the Lord. And He is worthy to be praised for vessels prepared for wrath and vessels prepared for glory. And so let us not play that game. Let us trust Him with the results. Let us be faithful with the testimony, church, and continue to wake up and press forward in these days He gives us. Matthew 5.16, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Church, we do all this for God's glory. Worship of God is the ultimate reason why we are called to be light bearers. The main goal of the church is to bring glory to God, to worship Him above all else. So again, see this throughout Scripture. For example, 2 Corinthians 4, 5-7, through For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Oh, church, I pray that we, we see the privilege it is to walk as children of the light and that we don't play light with it. We, we embrace it. We we, we go about our days with purpose. We live out the commands of the Lord. How, how are you potentially guilty of, of slow going? You're, you're stuck on the side of the road. You're, you're not hearing the commands of God, the truths of God, and putting them to work. You're making excuses. You're staying busy. No, let us be not hearers only, but doers. Where is the Lord called to move in your life? Then go to work. And live it out to, to not be stuck anymore. That you would be free to testify and live and thrive in the ways He's called you to do. Are you guilty of being all too focused on your current circumstances? Think about that for a moment. How, how much lately have you been guilty of just overly focusing on the things that you don't like about how your life is going. People you're doing life with or circumstances of different situations of money or health or whatever. If you're overly focused on these things, you're missing the point of your days. This life is not lived so that things would go your way. It's not so that you would just get along with your loved ones. It's not so that you just so that you would be treated justly or be given opportunity to succeed. It is to walk in the light. It is to give them Jesus, church. You need nothing because you have Jesus. Do you get that? Let's see what Paul says next. Second part of verse 8 and 9. It says, Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. The fruit of light is good. The fruit of light is right. The fruit of light is true. This makes sense because the light is Christ. The fruit of Christ is good and right and true. Amen? Because God is good and right and true. Notice he says, all that is good, right, and true. That's a huge statement. All that is God-honoring. All that is worthy of our great Lord. The evidence of being in the light is the fruit we produce. When lit by God, we will walk in the newness of Christ that produces the fruit of the Spirit. 
Our brother Scott Waterman taught on the work of the Spirit just this last week at midweek gathering. What a blessing. Thankful for my brother Scott and even more thankful for God's Word and as it's going to work in us. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Galatians 5, uh, verse 22 and 23. These are the qualities that reflect the character of God. And if you're walking in the light, these will be evidences that others see in you. Not perfectly, but growingly. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Is this true of you? If not, you don't need to work harder to try to produce these things. You need more of Christ. More satisfaction, more trust, more dependence on Him. And less of the affections of this world. As a branch, we need to abide more in the vine who brings life. Because we will not, as a branch, produce fruit on our own. This is why it's the fruit of the Spirit that God produces in us. Verse 8 says that we are to walk in the light. And then in verse 10, Paul adds that we are to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Look with me there. Ephesians 5.10, he says, Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. To discern means to examine or to verify. This word is used to describe the process of examining metals to determine their purity and their genuineness. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul famously spoke this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How do you discover the will of God? You discover what is pleasing to Him. How do we discover what is pleasing to God? We look to His Word. Discipleship is another major tool the Lord uses in our life to use other Christians to help us grow in our discernment of what is pleasing to the Lord. Surely you have been blessed by godly counsel. Surely you have been blessed by the truth of God in your life. The question is, Is that equally a discernment that causes you to go to work? Or again, are you making excuses? Are you stuck in your typical ways? Walking in the light and growing in God's Word and in discipleship is a really cool way that Paul is just highlighting in a way of overview the Christian life. Testimony of the gospel and the maturing in the truths of God and the walk with the church, the discipleship we're doing together is the focus of our days. Are these at work in you, Christian? I want to keep moving this morning and look at verse 11 through 14. As Paul builds on the point he made in verse 8, I wanted to have these passages together in the same sermon. His point he made in verse 8 is that we are to not become partners with those in the darkness. See how he adds to that here now in verse 11 and 12. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of the things they do in secret. 
First, Paul says that we are to not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness. The unfruitful works of darkness, the the fruit of the work of darkness, this is evil. This is wickedness. Wicked things that spring from sin and Satan. Of this, theologian of old John Gill wrote, Fellowship is not to be maintained with the works of darkness, which are sins, because they are opposite to light, to the light of nature, to the light of the divine word, both law and gospel, to the light of grace, to God the fountain of light, and to Christ the light of the world. The works of darkness are unfruitful because good fruit honors God. God honoring fruit grows from a tree that is healthy and spiritually alive, not a tree that is dead. We see this in like Matthew 7, 17 through 20. So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Church, if we belong to Christ, if we are grafted into the vine, then we cannot also be given to darkness. We are to avoid, we are to take no part in unfruitful works of darkness. They do not belong to us who belong to Christ. Jesus was clear in Luke 16, 13, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In our Ephesians 5 passage, Paul says it's not enough to avoid unfruitful works of darkness. But we are to expose them. Why? Well, in in love, so that others do not fall prey to them. So that the unfruitful works of darkness are seen as wicked as they should be, instead of being celebrated. Now, this does not mean that we have nothing good to say about or no connection to at all to people who are of the world and not in faith or who do nothing in faith. Can I like a song that a non-Christian writer speaks of a joyful memory at the bay he has with his wife? Or can I enjoy the acting of a non-Christian actor in a movie? I believe you can. Can I root for an athlete who is good at his sport, but not believing and therefore very lost in sin? Can I eat at a restaurant? that is owned by people who likely spend their money on worldly agendas. I believe you can. If you didn't do these things, there would be very little of life that you could do at all. So much of this world is owned and run by people dead in sin. You likely couldn't own anything, clothes, cars, Houses made by others subscribe to any services, mobile phone, computer software, do activities where your money pays people who are in serious sin. To do this, you would have to go out of the world. Yet God has specifically called us to live here as active lights. So my encouragement in that is to be very careful as we look to honor God's Word in this to not become pharisaical in how we walk this line. The key Paul is pointing out is that we do not personally participate in or directly encourage or celebrate the unfruitful works of darkness in others. You do not celebrate media that's promoting sin 
or endorse the personal lifestyle of the sinful athlete or endorse the extracurricular wicked causes of the secular organization. If a loved one is participating in blatant sin, then you do not celebrate or participate in that sin with them. This is why we don't attend or encourage so-called homosexual weddings. Or why we don't get drunk with someone to celebrate their new job. Can I still love and care for the homosexual unbeliever in certain ways that doesn't endorse or ignore their sinful lifestyle? Can I celebrate the new job with a friend in a way that honors God? Yes. But we do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness. Church, we're, we're called to be set apart. That's the point of our testimony. This is going to make waves in your life. You're not going to meet the expectations of the lost in your life of how they would hope and want you to just stay in the rhythm of the river with them. There's going to be many moments where you stop and say, no, I can't and I won't do that. It's the point of our testimony. We're not like the world anymore. We've been transformed by Christ The old is gone, the new has come. We don't belong to the world anymore. We belong to Christ. This brings a real tension point to many Christians that, that, if they're honest, don't like to hear, but we must. And that's the point that Paul makes here, that we're not just just to be set apart from them, but we are to expose them. Ephesians 5.11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. We are to love them enough to point out their sin. The word expose here means to rebuke or admonish. We are to do this in a way by which we are pointing out their need for a Savior, just as we have that need. We don't stand over them in self-righteousness, we point the light of Christ and the grace of God to save and set free. We point out their need to submit to the one true God and to know His will and His power for their lives so that they would turn from sin and death and submit to Christ and honor Him instead. Church, there is a hard reality that our standing in the light and our exposing others to sin to the light will mean for us. In other words, this is not an action that's without consequences. Both your not participating and your exposing sin and wickedness is going to mean real and hard consequences in your life. Don't be naive to think elsewhere. otherwise. It will mean real hardship in relationships. It will mean more than hardship. It will mean the loss of career opportunities. It can mean real and painful rejection from family members. It can mean a change in lifelong friendships. But again, Scripture is clear to say that this is not to be avoided because because it will be hard. But it's clear to say that This will happen as we are faithful to God's call in our lives to be lights in this world. These consequences. I mean, here are a few texts that speak to this. Jesus was clear in John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world will dislike you once in a while and talk behind your back. No, no, no. The, therefore, the world hates you. The, the world there is not just like big companies or entities or... No, no. That, that's anyone in your life who's still in the world. That could be a mom or a dad or a sister or a brother, a, a, a close friend.
Matthew 5, 10 through 12, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, standing for righteousness, therefore persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and all other kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. False, I mean, just evil that is coming at us. Christian, you can't go, hey, I'm doing something wrong because the whole thing's turning against me. Scripture is clear to say that's going to happen. He says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 10, 34-39, do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We read earlier in our Advent reading the arrival of lasting peace. What that's speaking to is peace like you've never known outside of Christ. Peace, real shalom in your life. This is game-changing, church. This is what Christ does in us. But what He's not bringing is pageant, model, peace on earth. Hey, what do you want? I want peace on earth. Yeah, that's not going to (laughs) happen. It's not. Because what is sinful and wicked will be damned, will be judged, is without life. And what is alive in Christ will rejoice, will will be protected. There is a war The Lord has come to bring greater definition to the separation of these things. We don't help things when we try to have pageantry peace. That's not what Scripture calls it to be. We are to not participate and we are to expose wickedness and darkness and sin. That's going to mean consequences in our lives. A huge example of this was the life and testimony and death of Stephen. You can read more about it in Acts 6 through 8. The light was surely at work in Stephen, so much so that the testimony said that his face was like that of an angel. Acts 6.15. His light in the gospel testimony, and his gospel testimony meant great hostility for his life. Even the pre-converted author of our very letter here, of Ephesians, Paul, in his pre-conversion, back then known as Saul, was hostile to Stephen. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read that Paul, then called Saul, himself approved of Stephen's execution for the very light he was testifying and the admonishment he was bringing. They stoned him to death for it. O oh, church, may we be ready to expose the darkness and shine bright the light. May we fully understand that when people we expose who are in the dark, it's going to bring persecution, it's going to bring turmoil. We don't 
sinfully, selfishly, fleshly choose to avoid these opportunities because it would be easier to avoid them. We do not avoid the commands of God to shine bright and to expose sin. We must step up and step out all the more for the glory of God and the good of those He will save. Amen? This is how Paul finishes his exhortation by saying in verse 13 and 14, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Many theologians believe Paul is quoting from Isaiah 61 through 3, which says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. The correlation works, church. God has set forth a plan from the beginning of time to awaken many from death to life, to bring them out of the darkness and to illuminate them with the truth that is Christ, to give them saving faith so they too can be lit. They too can be made alive in Jesus Christ. God doesn't call us to shine our light into the world for no good reason. No, He does this so that many will be exposed by the light of Christ. They'll be exposed. And they'll become visible. And come into the light and out of the darkness. John 5, 25, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming And is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Jesus says, truth, truth, I'm speaking here to you. Do not miss, hear it clearly. I, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, I who have the authority on all these matters, an hour is coming and is now here, the anticipated hour of the Redeemer, the new life maker, the Word of God will speak. And those who hear it will live. Those who were dead in their sin, who were spiritually bankrupt, those who were deaf and blind and morally corrupt, will hear and see and know my voice. And they will live. And they will believe. And they will move from death to life. From bankrupt to rich, from enemy to adopted son and daughter. I'm thankful for the Shockley's testimony this morning. and All that God's doing in them. But don't forget, it was not that long ago that both of these guys were lost in sin. Recently saved by God. Baptized into new life in Christ. By Shockley's own testimony and the testimony of those I knew who knew him, he was a heathen among heathens. A professional drunkard. A, a bruiser. And and by God's mercy, He drew him near and illuminated his dead heart. And for many to hear, Thomas Shockley was saved? He's a Christian going to church? (laughs) And, And then his unbelieving wife tags along in whatever this thing is that my husband knew, my new husband's going through seeing it as maybe generally good and having really no personal longing for it at all. Why? Because she's dead in sin. Could it be that God's will would be to save her too? And by His grace, by the preaching of His Word, by the shedding of light and Him opening up deaf ears, He says, I, ah, I trust God. I believe. I'm brother, sister, and she's baptized. Praise God. I mean, that... The, 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 the out of debt and the, and the growing in financial practice is awesome. You should do that too. Stop making excuses. Get that area healthy. But like, that's just like the cherry on top of this amazing cake that just recently happened. We need not forget that. And so let us continue to bear this light. Let us continue to be bold in these proclamations that even those that we think are so hopeless, are so gone, are not. If it be God's will, He will save them. That we would be bright and we would be We would be trusting Him. Even when this gets hard, even when this gets messy, you have 
a sweet and real fellowship among the body of Christ. Your forever family. Do you hear? Do you see? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Giving your life to Him. Oh Lord, may it be so for those in the room today who have not yet heard that they too would believe. The call on the unbeliever is to repent and believe from Holy Scripture. Or as Paul says it here, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. What a gift of God. What a perfect and complete work of Christ. What a responsibility we have been given to shine the gospel light and expose sin as folly. May we, may many come to saving faith and join our forever fellowship. Amen? In the light of your grace, you end my darkness. In the light of your grace, my burdens lose their weight. In the light of your grace, you lift my head up. In the light of your grace, my sin is washed away. This is our concluding ballad, our our praise to our good God, our celebration of all that he has done. Pray with me, and we'll sing loud to the Lord before we go. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing. For the ways in which you're at work, the ways in which you're stirring hearts, the ways in which you are awakening the dead in sin to life. Lord, if we are guilty of allowing our light to be under a basket because we want to avoid the drama, because we don't want to put up with the consequences and the persecution, Lord, let us repent of that. Let us us be humble in our testimony. Not be arrogant, not be flippant, but have a loving disposition, a tender disposition for the sensitivity of, of just what this means for someone to be dead in sin and apart from you and their greatest need to know Jesus and trust Him with their lives that many would be saved. Lord, I thank You for the fruit of this passage in Ephesians 5 in our lives and more growing fruit of the Spirit as we walk as children of the light be worshipped this morning, not just in this moment of response and conclusion to our service, but, but in the overflow into our serving second hour, into our, our, um, our day before us, our week before us, if you so will it, Lord, to be a bright light of this good news that is so sweet. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.